In this video, I'm going to talk about sound from an acoustic perspective. We're going to talk about how sound waves work and how they express three basic components of any sound that we can look at and observe physically that characterize how we perceive that sound. Those elements are the frequency of the sound, the volume of the sound, and the timbre of the sound. So all sounds are vibration. That's the fundamental principle at play here. Any sound you hear from a piano to someone talking or singing to any kind of noise in the environment like knocking or the sound of someone walking on a floor, these are all vibration. So musical sounds tend to be more organized, so to speak, in their frequencies, in their harmonics and the components of their sound, whereas environmental sounds can vary in all sorts of ways. But all sounds are vibration. All sound vibrations can be expressed or visualized in terms of waves, because that's how sound is really working. It's vibrations propagating through the air. And all sound waves have three physical characteristics that we can observe and that we can use to talk about them. So those three characteristics are pitch, volume, and timbre. So pitch is how high or low a sound is. We measure pitch in frequency. That is the wavelength of the sound. So frequency means that uh, a higher sound is actually moving faster. The waves are vibrating faster or the sound source is vibrating faster, whereas a lower sound comes from a slower vibration. So high and low are really metaphorical. As we saw in our video on pitch and rhythm, we like to visualize high sounds and low sounds in that way, but what we're really talking about acoustically is things that are vibrating very fast versus things that are vibrating more slowly. And when you look at a sound wave, you'll see that in the wavelength uh, through which each wave repeats itself. The length of a given repetition is the wavelength and that corresponds to the frequency. Next we have the volume. The volume is the intensity of the sound or the sound pressure. We measure this in a unit called decibels. So we talk about a sound being 30 decibels, which is fairly quiet, 100 decibels, which is very loud, 120 decibels, which will hurt your hearing, um, or even more. So we talk about sound pressure because as I said, sounds are really vibrations propagating through the air in the form of waves. When you look at a sound wave diagram, you'll see the amplitude the distance above and below the center resting point uh, that a vibration is going, and this distance corresponds to the volume that we perceive. A large amplitude is a very loud sound, a small amplitude is a quieter sound. Finally, the last characteristic is timbre. That word T-I-M-B-R-E is pronounced timbre, not timber. This is the quality of a sound. Tone quality or sound color are some of the words that you see to describe this. And it's basically what differentiates a sound if you were to hold the other characteristics constant. If you had a sound with the same pitch, or sorry, if you had two sounds with the same pitch, two sounds with the same volume, and if they still sounded different to you, it's because their timbres are different. Timbre is a little less measurable, but timbre shows up in the shape of a wave. Um, you'll see a wave diagram in just a moment, and the different sort of peaks and valleys and the different variations within an individual wavelength are what gives rise to timbre. And the way that actually works is the fact that when you hear almost any sound, you're very rarely hearing a single sound source, you're hearing the same sound source or multiple sound sources vibrating at different speeds together. And the combination of all those waves is what gives a sound its uh, tone quality. So, to get more specific, pitch is a phenomenon that arises from the speed of a vibration. So we call this frequency, and we measure it in a unit called hertz. Hertz measures the number of vibrations of an object per second. So for example, 60 hertz means that the object, like a string or a drum head, is vibrating 60 times per second. 
Now that sounds really, really fast, but it's actually very low. It's actually very slow in the grand scheme of things. It produces a pretty low tone. Um, the human auditory range, as it says at the bottom of the slide, is somewhere between 20 hertz, which is very low rumbling, all the way up to about 20,000 hertz, which is a high whistle or a whine or an electric, uh, electrical buzz. Um, those are sounds that are in the tens and 20,000 hertz. As you get older, even past your teenage years, you start to lose auditory acuity at the very top of your range. So uh, actually kids and teenagers can hear higher sounds than adults can. If you think of a dog whistle, dog whistles work because dogs can hear much higher than people can. Uh, dog whistles tend to be about 25,000 hertz or more. We can't hear them, but dogs can hear them very clearly and they can be annoying or even painful to them. You'll also see the word hertz used in different contexts. Um, different electrical or communications devices uh, use hertz in various ways. The transmission of any kind of a wireless signal, for example, or the refresh rate of a TV screen or a computer monitor. So for example, 60 hertz is a, a standard rating for a North American monitor. It's a little bit different in Europe or in Asia. Um, but that describes the number of times per second that the screen refreshes itself. You know, uh, most TVs can refresh their image 60 times a second, which is much more than is necessary to create a sense of smooth motion. You know, the standard in film cameras is 24 frames per second. A lot of digital video is shot at 30 frames per second, and that creates smooth motion to our eyes. Um, so you'll see Hertz also describe that kind of a sequence as well. But really, when we're talking acoustics, we're talking about the speed at which something vibrates, and that correlates directly to the wavelength, the speed of the vibration, and the pitch that we perceive. So if we think about a musical instrument, pitch arrives from some kind of combination of factors. Let's use a guitar string as an example. Pitch in a stringed instrument might arise from the length of the strings. You know, if you think about a ukulele versus a guitar, a ukulele has shorter strings, it's going to have a higher pitch in general. The tension of the string. Tighter string equals a higher pitch, which creates a higher note. A looser string creates slower vibrations and a lower pitch. And then finally, uh, the weight of the string or the mass of the object that is vibrating. A thicker string equals a lower pitch. Uh, when you buy a pack of guitar strings, you'll see that they have a gauge rating on them, which is a measurement of the lowest string, and the rest of them go sort of proportionally from that. Um, and that is what's another factor that's going to affect the pitch. A thicker string has a different kind of tension, a different kind of vibration, so even when it's the same length or a similar tension, it might create a different frequency. These same principles apply to wind instruments. If you think about um, a trumpet or a saxophone, you're blowing air into it, you're creating a vibrating column of air within the body of, body of the instrument, and then when you press the keys down, you're essentially extending the length of that column of air. You know, you're pressing more buttons down on a flute or a saxophone, you're sort of making the length go farther and farther down the pitch of the instrument. If you hold every key down, then the entire instrument is vibrating. If you hold only one or two, then sort of only the top of the instrument is vibrating. It's more complicated than that, but that's a, a reductive view. Same thing with a trumpet or a trombone. If you think about a trombone slide going out and the sound going boo, when you push the slide out, you're making the pipe longer. You're making the uh, frequency lower. The same thing, finally, you can think about your voice. If you want to demonstrate this for yourself, if you try to hum, say, a very low note, and then you try to hum a higher note, um, your vocal pitch comes from the tension of your vocal cords. And the reason that different people have higher or lower voices is the shape, the weight, the size, the um, elasticity of their individual vocal folds, which is this muscle that comes together in your throat. So just to give a quick demo of this with the ukulele, You'll see 
that its four strings have slightly different lengths. And the ukulele is actually strung in a different, in a strange way, in that the lowest string is actually the second string here. But you can see that this second string is a lot thicker than, for example, the fourth string. So they have a difference in pitch. Then the way that the pitch changes is as you go up by fret. The pitch gets higher each time you stop the string, and what's happening there is that the effective length of the string is actually shorter. The full string resonates here, something like half the string resonates there, then, you know, three quarters of the string, different lengths, different pitches. Finally, if you look at the tension, every guitar or guitar-like instrument or a stringed instrument like a violin or a cello has uh, what's called a tuning peg here. And you can raise or lower the pitch by making the string tighter or lower. So you can hear, if I loosen it, it goes lower. And then I can make it go even higher. So, a tighter string vibrates faster, it's under a higher tension. Uh, a, lo a looser string will vibrate more slowly. Um, and that's, those are the factors that create pitch differences across a guitar where all the strings are the same length, but they're different thicknesses, different densities or mass, um, and they are at different tensions. So let's look at a wave itself. As I've said, a sound wave can be used to picture all of the different factors that we hear acoustically. So this slide shows a really simple sound wave called a sine wave. I'm sure you've encountered these in math classes before. It's the same sort of idea. Uh, it's a very simple and repeating wave. When we talk about synthesis later in the class, we'll hear about different kind of wave shapes that you can generate, and we'll hear about tones coming together to create different sound qualities. But this is the simplest one we can visualize. So we can see all three factors here. First of all, we can look at the wavelength. Physicists use this character lambda, uh, that sort of loopy looking upside down y, to represent wavelength in equations. And that's showing you the distance at which this wave repeats. If you look to the very left side, it starts there on the center point, the origin. It goes up, goes back to the origin, and then back down, and then it comes back up. So one of those up-downs, that's one complete length of the wave. And so that's how we describe frequency. A faster vibration and a higher tone means that wavelength is going to go a lot faster. The wavelength will be shorter. You'll see more blue loops uh, on the screen. If you had a lower tone, that would be a slower vibration, and the wavelength would be longer. These would be sort of long, lazy swoops um, for a lower tone. Next, we have amplitude. We call it amplitude when we're talking about waves, but this correlates to the intensity or the volume of a sound. And so amplitude comes from the distance away from the origin point that the wave can go. And you can even think of a string vibrating back and forth. If it vibrates only a little bit, it's not going to be very loud. If it's really vibrating back and forth, it's going to be a louder sound. So that's the same principle here. We measure amplitude in a couple of different ways, but in audio applications, we tend to think both above and below as the amplitude here. And so a very tall wave indicates a higher sound pressure. If you picture a wave that maybe only goes halfway up to those dotted lines and halfway down to the dotted lines, that's a much quieter sound. Finally, timbre, or sound quality, comes from the shape of the wave. As I said, this is a very simple form, the sine wave. I'll play one for you right here. You'll hear that it's a, a very simple tone. It's an acoustically pure tone where only one sound source is resonating in a very consistent way. You can see the waveform is very smooth up and smooth down. It's not jagged uh, at all. So here's a sine wave. That's a relatively low one. It's about 120 hertz, uh, 120 vibrations per second. So different sound sources create different waveforms. So as I said, there are a couple of different simple pure tones you can hear. We'll talk about those later in the class on the synthesis unit. 
But there's also this, this fact that when you hear most sounds, whether they're musical or non-musical sounds, you're actually hearing a lot of different sound sources at once. You're hearing, for example, in your voice, you have your vocal folds, but you also have all kinds of resonance in your head and in your chest and the rest of your body and the room that you're in that affects the particular shape of the waveform. And that's what gives your voice its characteristic. If you think about the way your voice sounds different uh, to yourself than to other people, that's a function of how your voice resonates. You can also think about how it sounds different when you're sick, if your nose is clogged up. Uh, if your sinuses are clogged, you resonate differently, your voice sounds different, and that's because you're actually creating a slightly different waveform. So for example, if you look at this slide, we've got three different instruments graphed out here, the flute, the oboe, and the violin. They're all playing the same pitch. You can see in the middle of the diagram that the wavelength is the same, but they have different shapes. So the flute at the top has that sort of simple shape where it has a high peak and then a sort of lower peak and then it repeats. And this is basically that the, the flute is really giving you two sounds at once. Then the violin, you can sort of see there are three. There's a large flat peak, then there are, uh, it's sort of flanked on either side the way that the arrow divides it up with a short peak and then the, the tall flat peak and then another short peak and then it repeats. And then finally the oboe has multiple peaks. One of them is even sort of a compound peak there. And uh, this is the factor that makes these instruments sound different. They can play the same pitch, they can play at the same volume, but you still have a lot of acoustical information here that lets a flute sound different from a violin, or that lets two different voices sound differently from each other. And that's really the parameter of timbre or tone color at work.